Hello, friends. I'm Pastor Pitts Evans. Welcome to the Whole Word Podcast. Let's get right to the Word of God. Hello, friends. Today we're covering Nehemiah chapter 3. But I'm not going to read the chapter in its entirety um, because it, it gives a lot of names for people who did what. The general gist of the chapter concerns rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem. Now, this is a very interesting chapter, not because of the names of the people of who did what, because the description that is um, contained in chapter 3 of Nehemiah is the, the real chief authority for explaining the shape of ancient Jerusalem. This has been frequently discussed among scholars, and you'll find a lot written on it. Chapter 3 is a critically important chapter because of the mentioning of the gates and the positioning of the gates. And so in your mind's eye, if you can picture the city of ancient Jerusalem, it was not shaped like a square or rectangle. It was more like a kind of a lopsided hourglass. And uh, these gates, you would think in your your natural mind um, that there would be a symmetrical number of gates, you know, like three on this side, three on that side, and all the four sides. But it was not that way. It was configured very differently. And so the there were several gates mentioned in chapter 2. I'll just um, uh, read briefly from chapter 2. Verse 13, Nehemiah wrote, By night I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, so there's th- two gates, the valley gate and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. So all of these gates had been uh, ruined, either during the Babylonian uh, conquest or at some other point. And then verse 14 of Nehemiah chapter 2, Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool. But there was not enough room for my mount to get through, so I went up the valley by night examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered by the valley gate. And so we have three gates mentioned in these two verses, the valley gate, the dung gate, and the fountain gate. There's also a mention of the king's pool and its proximity to the fountain gate. And um, and therefore, we have some, some data. But the main data comes from chapter 3. Now, chapter 3 and verse 1, we read about the sheep gate and um, uh, who rebuilt the sheep gate. Let me just read verse 1 of chapter 3. Eliashab, the high priest, and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated and as far as the Tower of Hananel. And so we've got a gate, the Sheep Gate. We've got the Tower of the Hundred and the Tower of Hananel. And then uh, the next verse, the men of Jericho built an adjoining section next to them, and the Fish Gate was rebuilt by the sons of uh, Hassaniah, and uh, etc. So, verse 1, we read about the Sheep Gate and who reestablished it. Verse 3, we read about the fish gate, who rebuilt it. Verse 6, we read about a gate called, in various places, the Old Gate and the Jeshana Gate. Um, The Sheep Gate, the Fish Gate, and the Old Gate were located on the northern section of the wall. Remember in your mind, it's more like an hourglass than a square or a rectangle. Then verse 13, the Valley Gate is explained to be located in the western section of the wall. And then verse 14, the Dung Gate was located in the southern section of the wall. And then there's a a couple of gates mentioned in uh, what's referred to as the southeastern part of the wall. The Fountain Gate and the Water Gate were located in the uh, southeastern part of the wall. And then continuing on around, Um, to the northeastern section of the wall, we find the horse gate, the eastern gate, also called the beautiful gate in Acts chapter 2, and the muster or inspection gate. And so these, these three gates continue. So let me just recap. The sheep gate, the fish gate, 
the old gate, or Jeshana gate, um, were located in the northern section of the wall. The valley gate was located in the western section of the wall, and the dung gate was located in the southern section of the wall. The fountain gate, the water gate, were located um, in the southeastern part of the wall. And then the horse gate and the eastern gate, or beautiful gate, and the muster, or inspection gate, was located in the northeastern section of the wall. And so from that, and then the mention of these various wells and um, uh, towers contained in this chapter, the models have been built um, regarding the city of Old Jerusalem. And uh, you can you can take your own time and read through it and see, you know, Shalom did this, and Nehemiah did that, Hashabiah did this, and so forth. The people that um, did the repairs, of course, again, the Lord chose to honor them, but they were leading the repairs. And um, uh, the fascinating part to me of this chapter is the, uh, the gates. And so city gates were very important in ancient times. They were more than places that you passed through. They were places of commerce. These were like the marketplaces of the, uh, of the city. And there would be city officials positioned in each of these gates in times of peace to determine who could come in and who could not come, come in and so forth. So, example, uh, the sheep gate. If you were bringing sheep into the city of Old Jerusalem, you would bring them through the sheep gate. And there would be someone there to inspect them to make sure that they weren't carrying disease into the city, etc. The same thing with the fish gate. This is where the fish merchants would do their business. They would uh, transact business in the gate and transport fish into the city through the gate, etc. And so um, uh, these various gates had their functions and they had city officials involved. Now, the eastern gate that is referred to as the beautiful gate in Acts chapter 3 is a very important gate in both Old Testament understanding and New Testament understanding. This is the gate through which the Messiah is to enter when he comes to the city of Jerusalem. And of course, um, we believe that that happened when Jesus came the first time, and it'll happen again when he returns. The Jews are still waiting for this first entry or entrance by the Messiah into the eastern gate and our beautiful gate. So Ezekiel chapter 44 gives this prophecy. Ezekiel 44 verse 1. Then the man brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary, the one facing east, and so the eastern gate, and it was shut. The Lord said to me, this gate is to remain shut. It must not be opened. No one may enter through it. It is to remain shut because the Lord, the God of Israel, has entered through it. The prince himself is the only one who may sit inside the gateway to eat in the presence of the Lord. He is to enter by way of the portico of the gateway and to go out the same. So this eastern gate, the prince, uh, the prince of the Lord, was to be able to go and come through this eastern gate. Now, interestingly, down through the ages, the Muslim conquerors of Jerusalem heard about this prophecy from Ezekiel and this uh, messianic expectation among the Jewish people that the Messiah would come through the eastern gate. And so if you go to ancient Jerusalem today, you'll find that there's a Muslim graveyard in front of the eastern gate, and the eastern gate uh, is sealed. It's, um, uh, it's all bricked up where you can't pass through that way. And the reason being, the, the Muslims understood that it had to be a place of access for the Messiah, and the belief among them was that a Jew would not cross over a Muslim graveyard to go through the gate. Of course, that's um, not an impediment to Jesus. He's beyond natural concerns. The area may split in an earthquake, or he just may pass through, not bothered by the, the wall being bricked up or the graveyard. Whatever the case, this eastern gate is very important in both Judaism and Christianity, and it's guarded against in Islam. I think it's fascinating. But friends, for us, There are gates into our lives. There are gateways. There are places of access for the Holy Spirit. And God forbid, there may be points of accessibility to other spirits that are not of the Lord. We need to defend the gates of our lives, whether it's the gate of our mind, the gate of our physical appetites, the gates of our behavior, whatever gates are involved. 
we need to allow the Lord free access and forbid access uh, to other spirits. And so, Lord, we pray that you would defend the gates of our lives. Lord, that you would be positioned at every point of access in our lives. Lord, we grant you first and foremost permission to come and go as you will. But we ask you, Lord, to protect us from any other spirits that would try to access our lives. Lord, we recognize that these gates speak of things in our lives and not just about an ancient city. And so, God, we ask that the gate of our life to you would be the beautiful gate, that you would have free rule and reign, and that you would um, frequently come and go. and We would come and go in you. God, um, draw us, use us, and be with us now and forever, we pray, Jesus. In your precious name, amen. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Whole Word. It was brought to you by Whole Word Fellowship and the Northern Virginia House of Prayer. If you were encouraged, please share our podcast with your friends. We'd also appreciate it if you'd hit subscribe in your favorite podcast app and take a few moments to write a review. If you'd like more information on our church and our ministry, you can go to wholeword.net or wholewordpodcast.com for more information. Thank you again, and may the Lord Jesus bless you today and always.